we ready? We all set? Sure. Okay, hey, thanks for everyone coming here tonight. I'm really happy to be giving this presentation. Um, I have a couple things prepared, a couple slides for us to talk about. Um, but one of the things I'd like to have happen is as I go through some of this material, if any time you want to contribute or say something or just join in, go ahead and feel free. And uh, you know, I, I find that a lot of these models that w I, I'm showing tonight over the years and I've worked with open up a lot of discussion, a lot of interior, interior discussion, but a lot of also interpersonal discussion as well. The, the general idea of tonight's presentation is to talk about the ego in relation to spirituality. And one of the reasons why I wanted to do this presentation is that you hear a lot of folks who talk about spirituality and becoming more spiritual, and oftentimes you hear this sort of negative, um, a negative vibe, I guess, towards, or a negative sort of impression towards the ego. Like, in order for me to be spiritual, I've got to get rid of my ego, okay? And for me, in my, in my, in my journey, that, that was very much, at, 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 like I said, around 20, 21, 22 years old, very much how I thought things should be. That I need to just limit myself and sort of uh, sort of deny myself in order to become spiritual. And if you see in monastic communities and other types of spiritual practitioners over the years who went away, the ascetics are also called arhats, who left the world behind in order to achieve a spiritual connection. And as I was going through my process and my story, I ran into some contradictions there, some problems there. And one of the key ones is when I started studying Tantra or Tibetan Buddhism, one of the things that stood out in studying that in Tantra is that they, they make this very clear at the beginning, nothing is to be left out. So if anything that we're, to start this off as a theme, a theme being in spirituality, if spirituality is about the totality, is about a sense of oneness, is about a sense of connection, how can you leave things out? So this notion of nothing left out. So for me, going forward and grappling with this issue of how we treat the ego if nothing is to be left out, was a very pressing thing for me. And as, as I continue to look around and find different things to answer these questions, I, I ran into three different fields of study. Tonight is going to be a synthesis, in a sense, of those three fields of study. The first one is called object relations. Come on in. First one is called object relations came about in the school of psychoanalysis. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to understand how you develop your individuality, how you develop your personality. I see you guys. And in object relations, they wanted to go about in a way that could break down the process in which we create our identities. All right? There were some very, very powerful things that came out of that. And tonight, in a couple of these slides, um, we're going to be looking at the we're going to be looking at the process upon which the ego comes into creation and how that coexists with, yeah, coexists with spirituality or what we, what we can call the, the dynamic ground, okay? So there's a lot of different terms. You can use the word God, you can use the word unconscious, the collective unconscious, but I like the term dynamic ground. The, 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 the inception of, the, of, of, of basically when the ego started to emerge out of the symbiotic relationship that child had with the mother. Mo child, you might all know this, child leans over and bites the pillow. And then child bites their own thumb. The child starts to differentiate in the world the difference between thumb, ow, pillow, no ow. Okay? Very basic thing, right? But as the child develops and grows, that differentiation process becomes more and more complex. And the more and more complex that differentiation process, so too, the more and more complex that particular ego. The other thing that I'm going to be using today is depth psychology. This is Jungian depth psychology. And the idea of the self, capital S self, as differentiated from ego. So we'll be talking about that. So you can, you can refer to ego as lowercase self. And the self that we're going to explore a little bit tonight, um, capital S self, and try to get some idea about what that might be like. 
The third is transpersonal psychology. And what transpersonal psychology wanted to, um, to, to study and look at were these other states of consciousness that we saw monks exuding and all these other folks that didn't really fit on the Western psychology maps. So transpersonal psychology started to bring in uh, studies, uh, neuro studies and, and ethnography studies or anthropology studies of people who, who, who literally live in a different world while still being in this one. So let's move forward on our first chart. What you'll see on this chart, starting down here at the bottom, excuse my, my handwriting, is this word manifestation. And what we can assume by this line is that this is the direction upon which manifestation moves from an unconscious space into a conscious space. Okay? Everyone with me so far? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So this unconscious space um, is what we can also call the dynamic ground. It's also if when the child uh, is left alone in the dark, they might actually have this sense of feeling um, in a sense lost for a moment. Like, where did myself go? As soon as mom's gaze leaves the child, mom goes to the other room, child is, is, is in this world trying to grapple in a sense. Yeah, separation. To, yeah, trying to feel separated yeah. in that moment, right? And so what the child will do is like, how can I get mom back, right? How can I get myself back in a sense? And say they utter a phrase, that phrase, that manifestation out of that, this, this emptiness is this early child's impulse to create a self that is then, that will get itself back. So the child starts to learn how to speak, starts to do all these things because it's in the process of developing itself, okay? Where, where we're at in this conversation, because we're all not little kids anymore, we're not little babies, and let's get it like a little bit closer to the ground for where we're at. And also in context to this notion of how do we not separate the ego from spirituality, this is what I'd like to suggest. I'd like to suggest that where we are at today in our lives, in the creation of our own personalities, Mike is, has a beard. Mike is 6'5". Mike wears Converse because he thinks it's ironic. All right, these are all notions of, uh, that I've created around myself in opposition to being nobody, not being here. I want to be here. So what I've done is I've moved towards in the creation of this ego. Now where does that leave me in relation to spirituality? Well, oh boy, if I just get rid of this ego, boy, I get to be here. If I just get rid of it, then I get to be here. But here's the beautiful part, and I think that this is something to take away from this presentation, is that, yes, the ego is not this integrated space between the unconscious and the conscious, where you have this in the moment experience. I love this, it's a Zen phrase of the suchness, okay? That you experience the suchness when you're, you're, you're resting in the dynamic ground while simultaneously ascertaining the constant arising and being aware of it. Yeah, and being aware. You're in it, but being aware of it. Right. And that awareness is not affecting being in it. Exactly. So you, you're simultaneously aware of the ground of being while simultaneously experiencing the, the creation or the dance of being. Okay? As opposed to just being out here in the dance, and if you ever see me dance, it's not the prettiest picture. <laughs> um, instead of just being out here in the dance, you're also the dance floor, if you will. Yeah. yeah. All right? And th that sort of connection is, is, is why this capital S self is something we, 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 want to, we, we want to inquire into. What could this be like? What would this experience of being in this, ex this, this space be like. Now, sure, here's the ego out here in the world of consciousness, in some sense, fighting other egos right. and trying to differentiate itself out still. Now, how in that, how in this world can we like accept this part while simultaneously, good reminder, I'm going to set mine on, on vibrate. How is it that we can talk about these two things at the same time? 
Well, the ego, you know this great line, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? <laughs> you don't want to just disregard the ego. If you, in essence, from, from a, like a psychological point of view, if you want to talk about someone who has a great deal of connection to the unconscious, but have, have not developed the vessel or the boat or the, the, the containment of that experience, you can talk about things like schizophrenia. You can talk about things where people have personality disorders where the being able to hold together this is a very difficult thing. The waves over here are too tumultuous, right? So with that in mind, as you move out and you've created this space for yourself, how do you then allow, this is the most important, this is a good word, how do you allow this to traverse back? How do you just allow it to fold back into this place? Now, Jung, when he talks about the ego, when he talks about the self, there aren't two distinct things. In fact, when you're experiencing the self, your ego and everything just shifts back a spot. It's, you know how they talk about non-attachment in these Eastern worlds? This is the world of attachment, just being out away and disconnected from the whole. Okay? So this practice of non-attachment is a sense how you can let go of some of the things that your ego is holding on to, say it's work or money or whatever you're, you're holding on to. The, the strategy in these approaches, these monastic approaches, these spiritual approaches, is to let go of some of these things. Not to get this, but to ascertain what was already there. This space is always already the case. It's always already there. Letting go of some of these things is how you get to re recognize that with such. You're trying to get back to square one. Trying to get back to square one by realizing you're already at square one. Exactly, or it's already, like, it already exists. <laughs> right. yeah. So there's a great line. You don't exercise the ego to attain enlightenment or the self. <clears throat> you exercise the ego so it bothers you less, so you see what's already there, okay? It's the polishing of the mirror. You can stand in front of the mirror, and the reflection is already there. But if it's distorted, you have a, like a, a little Hitler mustache on your on your, you're gonna be like, damn, I look like that fascist son of a bitch. <laughs> if you just wipe that off, you see what's already there, and that's how beautiful you are, are all of you. Collective unconscious is a little bit different space. Now I want to do a little bit of a ninja move. How are we doing, first of all? How we, uh, I'm on board. Okay? Yeah. Okay? I want to do something real fast, and this is to give it a little bit of a, a perennial philosophy kind of vibe. So, because this is all depth psychology. And I want to do something. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Yes, it is. All right? Or mind, matter, and the Holy Spirit. The good, the true, <laughs> the beautiful. Okay? Platonic form. Platonic stuff. Um, in Buddhism, it's called, um, in Tibetan Buddhism, it's called the Dharmakaya, Nirmanakaya, and Sabayakaya. So these trinities are cross. You know. There's also the Neoplatonic school, it's called the three primal hypostases, and mm -hmm. similar type of thing. Why I brought that up, and I, I, I like changing this a little bit. And this is, actually brings up a little bit of an uh, emotional thing for me, so just bear with me. The Father is what watches and sees the Son. Okay? Beholds Him in His play. Accepts Him in His play. Right? The Son is what is manifesting out in front of the watcher. Dancing, trying itself on. Trying its place at work. Trying its place on making a living. Trying its place in doing all these things. The Father's acceptance is always there. Right? In its archetypal sense, right? So, the Father is already in you. The one that is watching God the Father is already inside of yourself as this unconscious force that's always present. Okay? Spacious dynamic ground. The Son is what is there and what is love. Um, another way to look at it is the, the beloved and the love. Right? And the Holy Spirit is this prana, this energy, this world of dynamic uh, dynamic energy, evolution. It's the constant dancing of phenomena, and it's the whole space. Okay? 
So I wanted to put that in there just to add this other kind of component, another way of conceptualizing the same territory just from a little different angle. Okay. Okay. And just to add one little piece. Jesus, the son, in the metaphor of the story, goes out, is manifest, comes into the world to, to then return to the Father. And the Father and he were one. The whole time. <laughs> so this in some ways clears up, I think, and for me it certainly has, some of the ambiguity behind the gospel from a more of a mystical, esoteric sense. Okay? So, let's talk about that. Let's talk about something in particular. We're going to talk about this movement towards creating the ego and why the ego is essential and what the ego teaches us and what the ego allows us to learn as it continues to develop and grow. Coming out of the dy dynamic ground, We've seen that humans have gone through an evolutionary phase that's lasted anywhere around 3 million years or so. It's about 100,000 years that we actually have had the same brain size, roughly the same brain size, is that we have today. And the last, and then about 50,000 years of that, we were moving up and through tribal and out of archaic. Okay? So we're hunter-gatherers and so forth and so on. Um, it wasn't until later on that we developed civilizations and written materials and things like this. But let's talk about why and how essential it is that we live true, not just to our spiritual selves, but also to our egoic selves. Because in, in being true to your egoic selves and being authentic to your egoic selves, you learn about how to handle ignorance, fear, anger, pride, and jealousy. And each stage we have gone in our human evolution and your own personal evolution is a way for us to grapple with these uh, knots that are lie dormant inside of ourselves so we can untie them. And just going back to that quote I, I said a moment ago, you don't exercise the ego to attain alignment, you exercise the ego so it bothers you less. You're untying the knots. So the ego teaches us in our steps, in our interactions with one another, in our evolution of ourselves, how to handle these things. And when these are transformed, they become the five, the, the five wisdoms, okay? And just for example, anger. You know how sometimes when you're angry at something, you just want to like pose a separation and like make a distinction, say no, right? That turns into discerning wisdom. All right? And these other various things turn into the reciprocal value. They don't stay as things to fight and hate about yourselves. By feeding this part of yourself and, 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 and tackling these parts of yourself, you are also transforming. Nothing's left out. It's Tantra. Nothing is left out. You're transforming these negative things into the reciprocal positive value. Because there's nothing absolutely wrong in the absolute sense. If it was, it wouldn't exist. I mean, absolutely negative. You know what I'm saying? Something's absolutely negative that never would exist. So there's positive in all these things. So let's talk about this and what, how, how we see this manifest in our world today. Our kids, mostly in kids, and folks that are in extreme, extreme poverty and have, uh, it, that you see out in the world today, it's, it, you'll find it in infants and folks that are really, really suffering like greatly suffering, where they, there might be psychological impairments, um, but there's also a great need, need for just for survival. Tribal you'll find in uh, adolescence as well, but also in inner city gangs. You'll also find it in other places in the world where the tribal consciousness is still thriving. Okay, And there's some of these places is very healthy manifestations of this, very healthy. Um, you can go into each one of these if you want. Now. As we continue going up this, we, we, we see that there is an ascending sort of widening array. And the reason why that is, is that you don't leave these previous stages. They still are inside of you. Okay? And as they are inside of you, they're still there to be worked on. They're still, be, they're still there to be nurtured. So 
How do we nurture our tribal selves? Well, what is your relationship to your kin? What is your relationship to your family? What is your relationship to your father and your mother? This is how one works on their tribal self. Okay? The so you're e saying that these things are inherent and need to be addressed in yeah, all of this. Absolutely. And just as these emotions are. Right. Yeah. Those, and, those emotions are basically like byproducts of that inherent. Yeah. This is they're like two sides of the same coin. Right. And these are the learning these are the learning components of each of these stages. <clears throat> right? Egocentricism, we can talk about um, instead of being in the game, we're talking about leading the game. This is where power establishing oneself. Power comes in here. This is power types. This is where you go out in the world. This could be a six year old in our society, a seven year old, an eight year old in our society who's going through grammar school and he punches the other kid just because that's what they did, right? But this could also be a 35 year old. Um, Gang, gang banger who instead of punching doc, doc, it's awesome. It's power. It's how you're dealing with and working with anger. If you have a deep-rooted fear inside of you that was not worked out with your tribal self because you had a bad upbringing, you can say. Father wasn't there. Mom was off doing something else. And you were thrown into a situation where you didn't have the proper tools to handle your fear. Proper way of understanding yourself and knowing that mom and dad are going to be there. See what I'm saying by, that, by this? So if you go through these stages, which you will continue to go through, right, right, and you are a 35-year-old gangbanger, and that fear, and that fear is still there. there. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and probably in, a, in, in an attempt to defend your pride, which is right about that. Yeah. Right. Right. And in particular, like if you look at the way in which pride, like fear, you exercise your anger and defend your pride, basically. I, I like how you brought that up because what you have with pride over here at traditional is where you can say the center of gravity is of our culture is tr basically traditional, especially Fort Worth. Dallas is modern and Fort Worth is going to be traditional. More. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> and so this, this, this tribal, uh, I mean this tr traditional self, uh, and, and I'm trying to bring in what you were saying, they know that's there, right? Say, say we're this 35 year old gangbanger, okay? They, they, they ascertain that this level is there, they haven't moved into it, right? So defend their pride against something they don't have yet, right. that they're not a part of something, they would as, as just go back to their strong suit, which would be utilizing power. And how do I attain more power? Genghis Khan, right? Um, Al Capone. Um, Al Capone is probably this, actually. It's probably blending of those two. Uh, George Bush is a, George the, not senior, senior is actually a little higher than <laughs> the junior. <laughs> junior. Junior was right here. And he was a mixture of traditional, uh, God save me and all that good stuff, and uh, business. Yeah. And that's why he won the election. Because he's the blending of like the center of the gravity of our country at the time. Okay? Postmodern's at the top, and, and where you're getting with postmodernism is you actually you start digging these things back up again, and you start playing them out again. So you can actually just take this these uh, five words here and then continue them up again. Ignorance gets reestablished, then fear gets reestablished at higher levels. And there's there's about, and if you look at this chart right here, um, and the studies done on this stuff, this is where we have ended our chart, and then there's one, two, three f stages that have been charted beyond it that are quite uh, sophisticated ego stages that are very hard to ascertain. I, I really don't even... <laughs> What's the name of this? And, 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 yeah, and who this are the, is, this who is who are the people that, that established those the other three? Like who this, were involved this, in that? This like, is the like word by monks or no? This is a guy named Claire Graves. No, no, but I'm saying like those three levels. Who is up here? That? Um, there, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's a small fringe. There's a guy. Name, there's a number of. Yeah, there's a very small cadre of folks that have done this from from all walks of life. Or from, from all walks of life. Okay. Um, ma mainly more modern folks that have done yeah. this. Um, and there, there's a lot of nuance and subtlety into talking about how at different times in human history uh, it, it wasn't yet available. Right. And that where, what someone achieved at the highest place at that time um, was where they achieved at that time in human history, you know. Uh, it, it gets, it gets it's a little bit convoluted and, 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 and right, little right, yeah. nuanced when you take time into consideration. But if we if we go off of now in our present day and we consider these things in relationship to that, um, these latter stages are going to be individuals like Vent Surf, 
you're familiar with him. He was one of the big founders of the internet. Um, another guy um, who did the Human Genome Project. Um, a number of these folks. A, a, another notable name is Sri Aurobindo, who was a uh, Indian sage, but he was also schooled at Cambridge. And he had uh, a very, I mean, he understood engineering. He understood all, I mean, he was a poet. He, it, 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 it's a very unitive type of consciousness. I mean, let, let me just read um, the highest one. Should I just read the highest one? Um, inner systemic evolution rules process. It's apersonal. It's the witnessing self that they are in at all times. Capacity to simultaneously be aware of ego identifications throughout the spiral. Without identifying with them exclusively. Powerful action, non-action without attachment to outcome. Compassion for evolution and the joy and suffering of individuals in existence. Sounds pretty cool. <laughs> so, how am I doing on time? Okay. You think I'm about 20 minutes in, 25 minutes in? You're 26 minutes in. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's start moving to wrap up a little bit and then have conversation and see where we can go and make our own chart maybe. Okay. So the, the the reason why I wanted to give this speech is because I hear so often this throwing the baby out with the bathwater type of approach to spiritual living that says, "Oh, that's ego," or "This is this." We're all going to have egos. The Dalai Lama has an ego. Okay. I was at a meditation retreat. And my spiritual teacher that I was there witnessing took a crap while I was at, at the John, and he comes out and he didn't even wash his hands, and then he went back to uh, doing his thing, okay? <laughs> this is all ego, guys. I mean, all, every drop of this stuff. Now, did he do all that with absolutely no attachment to the situation? Yeah. But it was still this, it, it was still this guy moving in the world. Right, right, right. Hello, absolutely. right? If you want to get rid of your ego, your body would just go, you, you you just you wouldn't you just wouldn't function. You just would be impossible. not functional. That's a great point. So, how then do we develop a, a practice, or how do we develop if, if we want to take this philosophy, this theory, and put it into practice? What do we do? And how do we live our lives? That is. We, we, we do the work on ascertaining the dynamic ground, which is always already the case, while simultaneously inquiring into where we're hung up. Are our hang-ups ignorance? Are our hang-ups fear? Are our hang-ups anger? Start there. Start where the ground is rich, okay? Start where you think that you have the most power or most oh, understanding and inquire into yourself while simultaneously still doing your spiritual practice or whatever you do. If you meditate, great. If you do yoga, wonderful. If you take bike rides, if you play sports, if you climb mountains, whatever you do to find your Zen spot, great. Do it. Do it as often as you possibly can. But then also simultaneously, the moment that something comes up while you're climbing that mountain or while you're in meditation and it has to do with some of these different things, be with it as the father is with the son. You are your own father this time in your life. You are your own mother at this time in your life, in a sense, in a certain sense. And you being with these different facets of your being, with all the awareness you can bring to it, is how we can turn these into the wisdoms that can not only show us the way, they can also show other people the love and compassion that is inherent in the dynamic ground and as the, as the self, capital S self. One might meditate and as they're in meditation, notice that a part of them wants to go do X, whether it be the, the laundry or to call a friend. Okay, so that hat comes up in the meditation. You notice that this is happening, this is arising. What do you do? Are you a good father to yourself? Or a not so good father to yourself? Do you go, stop having thoughts about other stuff, you're supposed to meditate? Or do you go, oh, we'll get to that. 
<laughs> uh, that's a much better approach. Yeah. Better than just expelling. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. Be gone. You're not enlightened. Get out of this house. <laughs> you know? We do this to ourselves, don't we? Totally. Yeah. Self chastisement. Yeah. It's the super ego. Like, it's exactly. The, su the yeah. super ego imposes itself. So, how do we have a rich spiritual life that doesn't throw the baby out with the bathwater, keeps the ego there to nurture along as we would nurture our own child? Fathering right. your emotions. You father your emotions and mother your emotions. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think. I think by going through this process with a sense that no matter what comes up, everything is accepted. No matter what comes up, everything is accepted. And the quality of that acceptance, and as you nurture that acceptance, you're going to start to be able to be true and present with yourself, and you're going to start to be true and present with other people. So that's my presentation. Yeah. And if there's, if we want to say a couple words or anything like that, if you guys want to, if you have any questions, if you think it's bullshit. Or <laughs> well done, Jeff Coat. That sounded. I, I agree with. You know. Majority of what you said. <laughs> uh, as far as let's to going back to expelling, like completely expelling the ego, or just completely ignoring things that your ego might bring up, because let's just or your super ego, which is let's just say you're trying to completely be still with your mind mm -hmm. in meditation. Right. And like you said, I got to do the laundry. Or I may have financial issues. Or I might have, you know, you're thinking of that, what I think, what I believe, especially, uh, you mentioned Eastern religions. But like what I think is like, the, not completely ignoring, but ignoring them, like to where you're ignorant of it, of right. that feeling or whatever's going on in your mind. But the, just expelling it for the time being is just like what this, this is. Because it's exercising your ego. Mm -hmm. to, for, for whenever, I think whenever I'm expelling thoughts like that, especially during when I'm trying to be still, still in meditation, I feel like that when I'm outside of meditation, it's easier for me to handle those mm -hmm. those situations as they come because I expel them already. Okay, so in a different realm. So let me hear if I'm hearing you right. Sometimes, as your own father, it's okay to ignore. Okay. okay. Well. <laughs> Well, is, is that true? I mean, is there there's a difference between a baby and emotions, but yeah. Well, you know, there's sometimes to ignore the child. There's sometimes not to ignore the child, depending on what it is. If something's really barking loud, right? And you know that just by ignoring it for a little longer, based on experience, it's going to stop barking. Exactly. That's fine. Now, there's some other things in your life that aren't going to be as, not to say easy, but as productive to ignore, mm -hmm. right? So, when, for example, fear comes up in meditation, okay, um, I'll just talk about something personal. I, I had a meditative experience one time that scared the shit out of me. But you know what happened when I got afraid of that? When I, when I didn't deal with that fear, I popped out of the meditation. I was no longer in that moment. So I, in a sense, I jettisoned myself out of the dynamic ground that I was experiencing at the time. Good and wordage. <laughs> just saying, I like the word Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. It was just, it just propelled out. Like, I, it, my <coughs> self, capital S self, hadn't developed enough time resting in the suchness of that presence long enough. So the moment that I had the presence, just a, just a, this much, so much fear, felt like my, my whole world was being ripped apart. Okay? If I stayed with the fear, Would it be the same thing as like, oh, oh. no. So, sometimes the most important thing to do, and I'll just tell a little story. It's a Milton Erickson story. And Milton Erickson's raising his kids. And the kid falls down and busts his knee. Okay? Kids. <laughs> right when he brings in the breath like that, Milton says, that hurts a lot. <laughs> he looks the kid around the eye. <laughs> and he goes, that hurts so much. <laughs> and he goes like that, okay? He goes, look at all that blood. <laughs> yeah, all oh, the blood, you know. 
oh my goodness, that's thick blood. I wonder if that blood is thicker than your sister's blood. Oh, oh, what? <laughs> uh, well, and then the, the uh, wife comes in. You know, if he soaks up all that blood, we can see how thick his blood is. <laughs> well, yeah. If you press down really hard on it, we can make sure it gets enough into the napkin to see. Yeah, yeah, napkin. Okay. Press down hard so it's all in there. Uh huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. <sighs> thick blood. Yeah. Yeah. You could. You know. And then the story goes on. They go to the hospital and they go, your sister had 10 stitches. How many stitches are you gonna have? I'm gonna have 20, you know? And I want them really close. And so they, they prepared and so when he goes into the doctor, the little kid goes, comes in. I want 20 stitches right here. I want them to be really close together. <laughs> but that pointing out in the moment and seeing what is coming up inside yourself, whether it be fear, pride, jealousy, or whatever it might be, in that moment coming up and says, oh, that's jealousy. You know? And I love this, I love this line, feeding your demons. Showing love towards what is afraid. Showing love towards what is angry. Showing love to what is, towards what is ignorant. And seeing what happens. It's like watering a plant. You know, it starts off as this one thing and then becomes this other, it transforms. I would, I would have to agree that acceptance, um, acceptance really is detachment. Ah. Um, if you're truly content, for example, you're completely detached from everything else. You don't need attachment, really. And attachment is fear, because it's fear of loss, really. You know, it's not, it's not that you're actually attached to something, you're clinging to something, it's, you're afraid that it's, it's going to disappear, mm -hmm. that it's not going to be there. Anymore. Like mom, early right. on. So really, acceptance is detachment, which is mindlessness, mm -hmm. which is egoless. Well, in a sense, not necessarily in like a Freud sense. What he's, what he's saying, though, the very fact that you sense. can do this is your ego. Right, yeah, no, I, I understand ex exactly what he's saying. And, and the transformation of the ego into this, this capital S self, okay, there really aren't that distinct. It's just like, I love this line. That, uh, I was reading a, a series of books, and what happens is one gets to a place where they're really allowing and really accepting their ego, and that, that, that transformation starts to take place. Then what happens is as what is petty and what is coarse and what is, is sharp is polished and smooth and made round, what happens then is, they say, through grace, your diamond armor comes down and new structures. This is like, uh, have you ever seen the Clash of the Titans? Yeah. You know, that's the great story, the mythology of when he went through this process and then the gods provided the helmet, the sword, and the shield. Okay? As one makes himself, uh, ex uh, they, they go through this acceptance of our evolution as a species and evolution as a self and then starts to go through and then do that polishing here, polishing there. It's like they're better equipped to deal with more. Better equipped to then actually wear the armor that you're destined to wear. Right, yeah, to ascend to a different level of acceptance, I guess. Right. Right. And to be in the dynamic ground while also. Sim always simultaneously yeah. in the dynamic ground. Yeah. Yeah. In all those mythologies were allegories for initiation, which was just really an allegory for meditation. Yeah. Unless you're actually <laughs> in meditation. Yeah. That would be a great presentation. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thank you all. Yeah.